This podcast is a member of the Place to Be Nation family. Visit us at placetobenation.com. The only place to be in your pop culture world. Hello, folks. Greg Dieter with you from It Was a Thing on TV as we come in with you with another trio of episodes here for you on the Place to Be Nation. Just a disclaimer here. The first subject of our episode is not an actual show. It is a joke made for April Fool's Day on our regular feed over at Podbean. So just, just to let you know... This first subject is not real at all. Although, personally, given the quote-unquote star of the show and the premise, oh dear God, do we wish it was real. But we had we had some fun coming up with the plot, the quote-unquote plots of these episodes. So we're going to leave it for you to enjoy as you enjoy the premise of Rip Taylor in Time. And then followed by... The Price is Right pricing games. 50 years on The Price is Right. Not every game is Plinko. Not every game is the game where you putt for a car. No. no there's There's been some plenty of stinkers on The Price is Right over the years. And then we'll be followed by a discussion of the 1997 videotape, The Kid's Guide to the Internet. So here's this week's episodes. And... Have a good time, folks. Talk to you later. This is It Was a Thing on TV. Spoiler number one is Dr. Lee Franz. It stinks. What is going on? (laughs) What is going on? Episode 45, Submission 846, Rip Taylor in Time. Rip Taylor in Time aired from October 4th, 1980 to November 8th, 1980 for six episodes on the BBC. And we're going to go directly into the show because, unfortunately, there's nothing existing of this show. No video, no photos, and we've done extensive searching. We just happened to stumble upon this show when we were researching about Rip Taylor for the $1.98 Beauty Show episode. And we found out that he did this in Britain off the popularity of the $1.98 Beauty Show. I didn't realize the $1.98 Beauty Show was popular in Britain. A number of times, shows in the U.S., which didn't really work so well, went to other countries and were popular. We mentioned this in the Manimal and Auto Man episode, where uh, Germany loves Auto Man, which really is unsurprising. Uh, Same with Manimal. Uh, in hey, some... hey, Manimal got its own annual in the UK. Yeah, so it must have done something right. Yep. And, and also, ALF is, like, really big in Germany. But also, uh, related to Britain, one failed show in the U.S. that actually garnered enough popularity to become a spoof on the Benny Hill show was a takeoff of future installment The Monte Carlo Show, starring Patrick Wayne. It was actually spoofed on uh, by Benny Hill called The Monte Carbolic Show. So obviously there there was some sort of popularity of The Monte Carlo Show in Britain if Benny Hill did a take off of it. And the thing is, it's not unlike what's happened here. Because how many shows have we gotten from overseas? I mean, Downton Abbey, Doctor Who. Um... Yeah. Well, the Great Britain. Anything involved? Anything involving? Anything involving Sharon Horgan? Well, I was also going to say the, the the British Bake Off, the Great British Bake Off. What What about Absolutely Fabulous? Absolutely fabulous Fab- answer. I'm sorry. Oh, I feel bad for saying that. And Chico did it too, so he should feel equally bad. I do. But continue. So in that realm, we had. Britain falling in love with the dollar ninety eight beauty show, and specifically Rip Taylor, and what was popular and still is popular uh, in Britain uh, on television, a little show called Doctor Who about traveling through time and space in a TARDIS. Well, somebody at the BBC had the brilliant idea of, hey, let's put Rip Taylor in a sci fi TV show where he travels through time. 
Sounds like a brilliant idea, right, guys? Of course. Uh, oh, I don't oh, know. I, oh, it I, sounds I like don't know. It sounds like there's possibilities there. Oh, yeah. It's, I mean, Rip Taylor, Time Machine, instant winner. And Rip Taylor, he actually just played a character called Rip. It was sort of like the Tony Danza syndrome. Tony Danza plays only characters named Tony. Rip Taylor played a character named Rip. So, you know, why change anything? And going through, uh, doing some deep digging into archives and databases, uh, we found out all six episodes of this show. There's really, in terms of co-stars, nobody really famous you'd know. But we, we found... Uh, we found capsules of all six episodes. And oh, the terrific! Ep- yes, and the first episode, which premiered on October 4th, 1980, was called No Nudes is Good Nudes. Oh, I know. Oh, this, is, this just screams a good time. Rip Taylor goes back to the 11th century and runs into Lady Godiva in full undress. Ooh! Ooh! So he's like the original peeping Tom. Oh, and did we tell you that in order for him to get back to modern times, his time machine runs on a certain type of fuel? It's Rip Taylor, so guess what type of fuel it is? It's confetti, shredded paper. (laughs) (laughs) That's just ridiculous, Mike. A time machine running on confetti. That's what the BBC did. So in order to get back to current times, Rip shreds the Domesday book, which is the book describing how to tax people. And remember, why was Lady Godiva running naked through the streets of Coventry? She was protesting taxes. Good on you, Rip. You got back to present day time, and Lady Godiva put on a shirt. That makes absolutely no sense. It's the BBC in 1980. It doesn't have to make any sense. This is true. It's very true. Episode two, Rip's Great Depression. Oh. Oh, Oh, this might hit a little too close to home, uh, given what the stock market has done the last couple weeks. Rip ends up in New York City in October 1929. Enjoying the high life with F. Scott Fitzgerald and a harem of flappers. Rip is caught by the feds with bathtub gin during the prohibition. Whoops. Yeah, whoopsie. So he's trying to avoid the law. And to get back to current times, in order to power the time machine, Rip ends up on Wall Street and Rip shreds thousands of stock certificates getting back home but also causing the Great Depression. Oh. oh. Rip Taylor caused the Great Depression. Who knows what ripple effects he has caused as a result of shredding all these stocks. Actually, fun fact, that's where the term ripple effect came from. Oh, very nice. I didn't know that. Oh, wow. You learned something on this show. Cool. Episode 3, Declaration of Dependence. Rip gets caught up at the end of the American Revolution, ends up tearing the Declaration of Independence to shreds to get back home, but also causes the United States to fall back under British rule. Oh, no. And and supposedly, the true loyalists in Britain absolutely love this episode. Yay, America's back under British rule. Oh, God. (laughs) <laughs> Sorry, it's fiction. Episode 4, A Titanic Adventure. Rip ends up finding himself on the Titanic and narrowly escaping disaster by salvaging as many menus from the dining area of the Titanic. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> and, barely like, oh. Es- and barely escaping death by drowning. Say it, Greg. I know you have something to say about this episode. I just, he just, he just, I need some paper to get back on, back, back to modern times and the boat's sinking. What can I do? Oh, well, oh my goodness, there's some menus here. I'm going to rip all the menus. This yeah, there must, I mean, the Titanic had like, what, 1,500 passengers. So you got to figure there's like 1,500 menus. 
Yeah, oh, totally. So and it makes they, total sense. And there's no use for the menus. The ship's going to sink anyway. Right. Well, it would have been good if Rip actually took somebody with him. But yeah. Rip, yeah, I mean, that, that would be like one or two less victims. But yeah, at least Rip survived. He got off the boat, barely escaping death by drowning. Unfortunately, guys, Jack Dawson didn't make it. No. No. Did he have? Did he? Did he have to figure out whether Jack and Rose would, would fit on the door? No. Okay. Episode five. You sank my battleship. Oh boy. I, I, I could already. I could already tell where this is going, and it's scaring me. I'll see him. Well. Rip ends up in 1918 at the conclusion of World War I. I was wrong. Okay, continue. Rip celebrates worldwide peace, but is stuck in a confusing post-war era. Rip struggles to survive for over a year, but gets his lucky break in 1919. In 1919, the Treaty of Versailles was signed, and he ends up ripping the Treaty of Versailles to shreds, enabling him to get back home, but also causing mass chaos throughout the world and the resumption of worldwide fighting. Oh, boy. Thanks a lot, Rick. Rip. Yeah. Everybody died because of Rip Taylor. Boo. Boo. Well, the last episode, this is sort of an experimental episode. This actually gets into the sci-fi portion in terms of not just time traveling, but actual science fiction. It's episode six, Rip Taylor in Time and Space. Rip fights the space cats in the year 2010 and rips up an intergalactic treaty to power the time machine so he can get back to modern times. Modern times being 1980. Yes, that's so prophetic. 2010, space cats? So now, now we know where Bill Hader and Andy Samberg got the idea for laser cats. Yeah, <laughs> that's crazy. It's cats in outer space fighting in an intergalactic war. That's that's even goofy for the BBC, and they've done you know frigging Doctor Who now for going on sixty years. Oh, you, know, you know, Doctor Who is known for being goofy. Combine that with the goofiness of Rip Taylor, and it's extra gro- extra goofy. The Space Cat. Boy, I wonder how TC and Benoodles would feel about this. Hey, girls, how do you feel about Space Cats? Oh, TC's asleep on the couch. Oh, TC's giving me a glare. She doesn't like the idea of Space Cats. She doesn't like Space Cats? Go back to sleep. I'm sorry, but uh, TC. No Space Cats for TC. Oh. Yeah. See, so yeah, unfortunately, this uh, show ended up not surviving. There's no footage. As I said, uh, we had to go through some archives and databases to find some uh, information about this show. Yeah, unfortunately, Ian Levine was too busy saving some of the 1960s episodes of Doctor Who than the bother trying to save this show. Well, can you blame him? I mean, this lasted six episodes, and Doctor Who, as I mentioned, is going on almost 60 years, 57 years at this point. Hey, so you've got you to prioritize. Yeah. Although, I, I'll be honest, I would like to trade whatever existing parts of the Daleks Master Plan exist just to see one episode of this show. Well, maybe, maybe it's buried in a landfill in Sheboygan. I don't know. Yeah, it's probably somewhere in the English Channel, unfortunately. With the Feast of Stephen. Or maybe they recorded over it. They needed to get an episode of of some TV show that we don't care about, like Countdown or... I know it's that, that, that's Channel 4, not BBC, but... Yeah. Yeah, they, they, they needed to record some crappy game show with Bruce Forsythe. They needed to recycle the tapes for the Generation game. I will not have you bad about the good name of Bruce Forsythe, good sir. Uh, I'll I'll ask for forgiveness after we record this episode. Speaking of that, <clears throat> Chico, do you have anything nice to say about this? Rip Taylor in time. Rip Taylor 
ripping up documents for confetti, causing ripples along the space-time continuum that would have to undoubtedly be fixed by another time-traveling BBC resident. <sighs> In 1980, God help us, it was a thing on TV. Promotional consideration paid for by the following. Place Your Nations, JT Rosero and Chad Campbell here. We want to let you know that we have over two dozen podcasts available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and PlaceFeedNation.com. We now offer them to you on two great feeds. On the PlaceFeedNation Wrestling feed, we dive into topics running the gamut from today's WWE to the glory days of yesteryear and the ins and outs of the territory days. In addition to our full-length shows, we also deliver to you special pod blasts on topics old and new. The Place to Be Nation pop feed is a veritable treasure trove of great content. Offer tremendous shows covering the land of movies, television, life, comics, and sports. Brought to you by the most knowledgeable and insightful folks in the podcast world. You can find all these great shows, plus archives of our past podcasts from over the past eight years as well, by subscribing to both feeds on iTunes. And while you're there, be sure to rate and leave feedback as well. All of these shows, plus others, available on PlaceMedation.com, where we cover pro wrestling, sports, movies, comics, plus in-depth search projects, and much more. Be sure to support our site by using www.PlaceMedation.com forward slash Amazon when doing your online shopping. We want to thank our friends at Bonehead's Wing Bar, ProWrestlingOnly.com, and TheHistoryOfWrestling.com as well. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Tumblr. PlaceMedation.com, the only place to be in your pop culture world. Episode 46, submission 1096. We've broken a thousand, guys. Yay! Woo! Yeah, we have many more entries, folks. We're not just three digits, baby. Retired prices right pricing games. Well, guys, you know what every single game on this themed episode has in common what's that they're not being played any longer yes because they all suck Aww. well well for well not every game can be plinko or or hell not every game can at least be danger price but you know give prices right you know some credit uh, it's been on the air for what 48 years in its current iteration yeah, it's two years away from turning the big 5-0, baby. In those 48 years, you get to experiment with a whole lot of games. But not all those 110 games have been winners. Nope. Yeah, for, for every punch a bunch, there's, well, we got enough games to talk about. And we're not going to cover all the retired games And there's actually some retired games that we wanted to talk about but just didn't make the list. So we'll acknowledge those right now. Uh, Specifically, I'm talking about Double Digits, Mystery Price, and the Phone Home game. But we have 12 other games that we want to talk about. Right, Greg? Yeah, and we'll start with Double Bullseye. Now, this is notable because this is the only pricing game in the history of The Price is Right. Where that involved two players. And you're thinking, what? Two players involved in a pricing game? Greg, how did this work? Well, let me tell you something. Here's how it began. After winning a one bid, the contestant would come on stage, and then a new player would be called to contestant's row to participate in another one bid round. And so the two winners of the one bid round would play against each other, and they would give alternate in giving bids on a car. With the with Bob Barker indicating whether the correct price was higher or lower after each of their bids, and the first player who guessed the exact price of the car won it. And the thing is, this would later be recycled on the Australian version of Price is Right. This is actually how they do their showcase round. They say the showcase is valued between X and Y dollars, and the winner of the showcase is the one who bids the right price to the dollar. So it does live on in some capacity. But besides the obvious, you know, two contestants, do you think this might have died because it guaranteed a car being given away? Could it have been a, not necessarily budget breaker, but maybe a budget harmer? 
Yeah, I'd say so. Yeah. I mean, I know the cars that they offered at the time may have been $3,000 at most, but $3,000 47, 48 years ago went a lot further than $3,000 nowadays. Oh, totally. And they did actually do a version of Bullseye with one player, and the one player version of Bullseye had them doing the same game, but basically getting seven chances to guess the price of the car. And also, I think, sort of like this, it wasn't played that often. I mean, there may have been a single digit number of, of games played. Uh, and I don't even know if they had a winner on that version. So, yeah, two versions of the same game didn't survive, but the other version of Bullseye has done just fine for the past 40 some years. Yeah, they've got touch screens now. Well, I'm going to talk about another game from the 70s, and this one is called Finish Line. And Finish Line really was a ripoff of Give or Keep, which is a very popular game that was played on The Price is Right for pretty much like the first, I'd say, 15 years of the show, more or less. I think it was played from like 1975 till about 1990. So it, it was a long-running game. It was the same game, except it had a horse racing theme. And the idea was pick the more expensive item in a group of two, and the item that wasn't picked, the price would be revealed, and the finish line would be moved that many spaces away or that many paces away or whatever you want to call it. And then after you do this three times, you have a certain distance between the horse at the starting line and the finish line, and the goal is your horse has to move at least to the finish line or beyond the finish line based on the prices of the three items that you chose. It's basically give or keep just with a horse racing motif. And it's a really amazing motif. I mean, it's it's beautiful how they set it up. I mean, they have a tote board like you'd see at Santa Anita or Churchill Downs. They have the fencing. They have bushes. I mean, they gave it a, a good sense of realism. Uh, the problem is, like I said, it's a carbon copy of an existing game, but also from what I've heard, there were technical difficulties with the, the horses. And obviously when you have so many moving parts, the, the finish line, that gate's moving, and also the horse moving, you can see how it might have been canned pretty early because there's a game already like it, but also just too many malfunctions. Less props intensive, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, well, Give or Keep is the less props-intensive type of game. It's just a board with three sets of two prizes. You pick which one of them is most expensive. Bob shows the uh, price of the of the item not chosen, closes that window. The price goes on the on the board uh, on the uh, on the give side, and then you after you give all three items, you see how much the keeps are. You add them all up, and as long as the keep is more than the give. You win. Simple. It should have been simple, but just just like a duplicate, like I said. But Chico's got another game, and this is actually a game the two of us saw in person uh, a number of years ago. Yeah, it's a game called Joker, and the object is you have five. You have a five card hand. The Joker is hiding in one of the five cards. You have to discard the Joker in order to win. That's pretty much the game. Now, how do you get discards? You get discards from pricing four small items. Like, there's a small item. Is it $26 or $62 or $38 or $83? And if you're right, you get the prize and you get a discard. Now... This 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 game lasted a good long while. It was from 1994 to 2007. And here here's the thing. This has a bit of a flaw built into it. Just one flaw? Okay. Several flaws. Uh for one, 
it was played 80 times, so it was kind of like they were ramming it down our throat. And for another, it was like, okay, we can't have a price. We can't have a pro. We can't have a price whose price was ended in zero. And you couldn't have a price that had the same digit. You couldn't have like sixty six dollars. Yeah, and true story. Uh, according to uh, secondary truth by consensus fandom dot com. Uh, Roger Dopkowitz noted that the game had fundamental problems, an awkward reveal, and a contestant could earn all four prize, small prizes and still lose the game. Which is true for a number of games. I'm looking at you, Secret X. Mm-hmm. Now, you see, my issues with the game, I love the pricing uh, uh, part of this. I love the 38 or 83 or 54 or 45. I think that's brilliant. I think that needs to come back in some capacity. My problem is this game just looked cheap. I mean, it looked like it was thrown together in like no time. There was very little thought uh, put towards the game. Plus also another thing is the Joker itself was a red background card while the other cards were white using the same type of uh, face that you'd see on the Hit Me cards. They, or, they, a true or, story, or, they actually did use the Hit Me cards. The Joker was sort of a sticker that they would affix on one of the Hit Me cards. Uh, or if you wanted to go back even further in time, the original Gambit cards. The, the, the red background Joker, unfortunately for me, stood out so much. But also, the game was played on like a plexiglass platform it was it was transparent and i'm wondering if there's some way that the contestants could have possibly seen in the reflection of the glass what card it was Hmm. possible possibly if all the cards are white it would be harder to distinguish which one's the joker now i I understand you know television it's a visual medium You've got, you know, you want to see the difference because you maybe could be able to tell one card from another or you wanted the Joker to stand out. But I wonder if, because the the Joker was primarily red, if there was some way they could see through a reflection of some sort and thus giving them a, a obviously better chance at winning. But still, it just overall looked like a cheap game. I mean, the set itself was... Uh, the Joker sign, uh, the the name of the game, the signage, in five different fonts. It looked very messy, and you had the platform with five cards on it. it looked very, very lackadaisical. It, it just, I mean, I don't miss the game at all. And she, as I said, Chico and I did see this game at a taping of Prices Right back in 2006, and. I didn't even know it was still around at that time. Man, it was a dog back then. It was a and, dog. Yeah, it was a horrible game. and But also at the same time, think of it this way, Chico. You and I saw one of the last playings of Joker. Not many people can say that. Yeah, you're absolutely right about that. Greg, do you have another game lined up? Yes, I have one. It's called... On the nose. Now, this was a pricing game where a contestant had to perform a sporting feat to win. It was played for a car and a potential cash bonus of $1,000. So to win the car, the contestant had to successfully complete a sporting feat. Five different sporting events alternated in different playings of the game, which included throwing a mini football or a baseball through a hall in the game board, making a free throw with a mini basketball popping a balloon with a dart, and hitting a tennis ball through a hole in the game board. Before the contestant attempted the feat, they first had to determine how many chances they would have to perform it. The contestant was shown four possible prices for the car. Picking the correct price earned the contestant four attempts at the sporting feat and a $1,000 cash bonus. 
Choosing the nearest incorrect price earned the contestant three attempts, and the next closest price earned two. And the price farthest away from the actual retail price earned just one attempt. Those other three prices awarded no bonus, and the number of attempts was represented by revealing a certain number of whatever implement was used in the particular task of the day. Also, Bob Barker would perform an inspiration attempt of at the task, similar to Hall in One. And I sort of have to figure that that's how this game originated. Hole in One was a reasonably popular game. And hey, let's spin it off. But now let's do different games, not just golf. Let's do basketball and baseball and darts and football. And it just didn't work. But also it didn't help that, and this wasn't true of all the contestants, but Obviously, if you have just like one or two contestants that fall under this category, it's sort of unfair. If you have a senior citizen playing, yeah, can you see a 70-year-old shooting a free throw or throwing a dart trying to hit a balloon? I'll take that sound as a no. (laughs) Sorry about that. No, that's fine. So can you see a senior citizen trying to uh, make a free throw or trying to throw a football through a hole from however many yards away, five, ten yards. I, I, I just could, don't see that happening. I could see it, but it would not be pretty. It, it definitely wouldn't be very pretty. Plus, also, you lose the home viewer because there's no participation for the viewer at that point. Mm-hmm. It's now, let's see if if Gertrude can uh, can throw the football through the hole by the receiver's shoulders. Not a, a very interactive game. No, after, not... after you get through the preliminary part where you determine how many attempts they get. Nope. But the funny thing is, despite it being around on the U.S. version for a year, it's actually been on the German version, and it's had a long life. It's actually the host of the German version of The Price is Right, Harry Rinvord. It's one of his favorite pricing games. Well, good for him. Different strokes for different folks. Well, I'm going to talk next about the telephone game. This one is an obscure game, not played very often. Very weird, very hard to follow along with. So it starts off with four grocery items, and you're given $1 to purchase two of the grocery items. And the idea is to spend no more than $0.90 cents so you have at least a dime left over to use on a pay telephone. Because back in the day, well, you got to remember, pay telephones were a thing before cell phones, but also calls were just a dime. So if a contestant succeeded in spending 90 cents or less on these two items, they would go to this telephone booth, and there were three phone numbers. And the three phone numbers corresponded with the prices of three items. Two of the items were small prizes, and the the four numbers represented the dollars and the cents of the item, so like $45.70. And then one of the numbers represented the price of the car. But remember, you don't see the decimal, so you don't know which item is the car, which one are the small prizes. So you have basically a one in three shot of getting the car. So the person would actually dial the phone as a rotary phone, a rotary pay phone type uh, of phone. They dialed the phone number, and then a few seconds after dialing the fourth digit, one of the three phones would ring. And whichever phone rang, the prize that was associated with that phone would be the item that the, uh, the contestant won. So again, there's two small prizes probably in the range of about $40, $45, $50 each. And then you've got the car, which would have been basically 100 times that, $4,500 to $5,000. And this game was not played that often. And there is one example of this game being played on the Internet. That's how rare it is. Wow. Yeah, it's one of those games you need a flowchart in order to, to understand yeah, well, yeah, one of the one of the one of the secrets behind a good Price is Right game, the kiss rule. Keep it simple, stupid. 
But this one was almost incredibly too simple. And in retrospect, probably uh, probably a duplicate. Thank you, Brain. Uh, we have the gallery game. This is another game that was pretty much force-fed down our throats between September 10th, 1990 and April 1st, 1991. It was played 24 times in that short period. And that's exactly how long it lasted. Basically, you had a price with one number missing a few key elements. It could look like a three or an eight. Or a zero. And what the player had to do was paint in the missing pieces to give a price to the prize up for bids. It was in the 24 playings, it was only won nine times. And again, it, it was one of those one of those games that was a little too simple, but at the same time, it's like, oh, geez. Uh, it, it was sort of complex to set up, which is probably why it got the axe rather early. Because, A, you have to come up with a painting for the prize, for the prize, and B, you have to set up not only the, uh, not only the, the prize to be painted in, but the, but the reveal. So yeah, it was just way, it, it just seemed like it was way too simple. Of, of course, you also had pick a number do the same metric. I think pick a number would come later, actually, now that I think about it. 1992, yes. Yeah, so so pick a number would be the replacement for this game. I just wonder how much it would have cost to create those paintings. I mean, the, the art was, you know, it wasn't done by a kid, but they had to do two of the exact same paintings. I'm sure duplicating wasn't that difficult, but... I mean, they had to have somebody on staff or in the art department which had to do that. Yeah, this yeah. was quality art. This wasn't like the uh, the guy who drew the sketch of the leprechaun in Alabama. Future installment <laughs> coming coming uh, March twenty coming March twenty twenty one, folks. All right, Greg, what do you have next? Okay, so the next game I have is the Shower Game. Now, the Shower Game premiered on September 4th, 1978, and had its last playing on November 30th, 1978. So this game lasted two months. So what this is is a game with six shower stalls arranged in a row, like a locker room, and each stall had a possible price of a car attached to it. So the contestant enters the stall bearing the correct price, and he pulls it, he or she pulls a chain attached to the shower head. If they chose correctly, a giant key would lower from the stall ceiling, and the contestant won a car. The five other showers were randomly divided into three, which showered the contestants with confetti, and two of which showered them with $101 bills. If the contestant selected a confetti shower, they could choose another shower. If, however, the contestant selected a money shower, the game ended, and the contestant left with only the $100. But there's really a, a key reason this game didn't last that long, right? Oh, yeah. It was not fun. It was, like, boring. Yeah, no well, not, well, well, not just that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That whole thing with the, oh, yeah, Jewish people didn't like this because it reminded them of the Holocaust. Yeah, because, yeah, yeah shower stalls and the Holocaust, enough said. Oh, boy. Well, I mean, it, it, it's, uh, the, the game is good in theory, but maybe they needed to use different props. Maybe like a hat, like a, like a home shower or something. Maybe just totally avoid the showers. Yeah, but yeah, it, there really was no strategy in the game. There were no you know hints given. You just had to grab a handle in the shower stall and hope for the best. A very luck based game, but yeah, it did not last all that long. Well, one game that lasted a little longer is the game I'm going to talk about right now, 
which is called Add 'em Up. Add 'em Up lasted over two years, believe it or not. It debuted uh, in 1986, uh, September 11th of 86, and it was retired uh, in October of 1988. So it got a little bit over two years worth of use. Now, Add 'em Up was a card game. And the idea of the game was you had a display over the car which showed the four digits and the price of the car. Because remember, this is the late 80s. Most cars didn't cost uh, more than $10,000 at this point. So you'd have the four digits there. And then the game board would show you what the four numbers added up to. So you'd have four blanks for the four different digits. And let's say they added up to... 17. So what that told you is the four digits in the car, if you add them up, adds up to 17. So in this game, there were no free numbers given. That would make it a little too easy. So the contestant was allowed to make one mistake. And once you make the one mistake, the game is over. But the thing is, if you get one number, that narrows down the possibilities of what the other numbers could be, especially if the first number you go for is the first digit of the car because back then cars would have been in the six, seven, eight thousand dollar range. So if you know the sum is 17 and the first digit of the car is eight, well, then the last three digits have to equal nine. And yeah, you know, there's some logic in, in play because you know, how many combinations of the remaining digits could you make to uh, add up to nine? You could, you really couldn't use any numbers bigger than. Then seven, because it's a uh, you know, seven, two, zero, the eight's already in play. You can't play the nine because you can do the zero, but you know, there isn't a second zero on the board. It's just a different digit, so you have to play one. It was basically so, a giant Sudoku puzzle. It, it's a logic puzzle. Yeah, you, you got to think it out. And, and the game just got canned because contestants just didn't understand it, which sort of you know enforces the stereotype that, Americans don't understand math, which is you know sad but true in some cases. I mean, I thought it was a clever game, and the game sort of does live on now somewhat because the scoreboard, or at least the font for the scoreboard, is currently used on the game Pathfinder. I, th- I believe that, they 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 reused that prop. Yeah, and it has that funky uh, sort of uh, typeface. Uh, Almost sort looks of, a little bit like a '60s type of uh, type face, yeah, like a '70s. Sort of looks like a Cooper meets balloon. You're the typeface pro. I'll take your word on that. <laughs> yeah, if there are any typeface, if there are any typeface bands listening, give us a holler, will you? And up next is Chico, and oh, he's got a oh, he's got a doozy of a game. Okay. It's a doozy. It is a doozy. It is most most of these games we need a flow chart to explain. This game is literally a flow chart. It is called On the Spot. You start on the spot. You have to get off the spot in order to win a car. The circle had three colored paths leading from it to the outside of the spot. Blue, yellow, and pink. Each path consisted of three steps marked with prices. These prices correspond with six small prizes, which were shown to the contestant. The contestant selected a path and moved to the first step. They had to select the prize whose price matches matches the step they were on. They selected correctly. They won the small prize and repeated the process until they were off the spot. If they got one wrong, they'd have to get back on the spot and try another path. But if they get three in a row correctly, they moved off the spot and won the car. But there were always some duplicate prizes on the on the three paths. So if the contestant had correctly guessed the price on a previous path, they were allowed to skip that price on succeed on subsequent paths. Do you understand what I'm trying to say here? No. Uh, I Good. get it. But uh, I understand because... it. 
<laughs> I was just about to say, good. It's good that Greg didn't understand it because that's one of the reasons why this game was canned after almost two years between 2003 and 2004. It also looked really cheap. I'm sorry. Yeah, not only cheap, but it was up. A, they had to rejigger the game a bit because when it was first played, Bob saw a price as sixty eight dollars when it was eighty nine dollars. Ooh, yeah. So if you actually look at later plays in the game, you can see. In small black print below the price, you can see a duplicate of it facing Bob and the contestant. Right. That's not good. No. Anytime a game is removed from the... uh, Anytime the game was removed for retooling, yeah. In fact, one of the uh, official reasons is... It's too confusing. That seems to be a common thread among these games. Too confusing. Yeah. Oh, but that that and it looked kind of uh, it, it 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 uh what's the word I'm looking for here? Loud. Cheap, cheap, cheap. It looked loud and cheap. Well, speaking of confusing and other adjectives we could use. Oh, yes. Oh, Greg, I know you've been waiting to say something about this game. Oh, yes. This is, I would say, this is the queen mother of bad prices, right pricing games. Would you agree? Yeah. This is definitely among the top, yes. This is Professor Price. Now, this is a pricing game played for a car. So what this game involved is it involved up to five questions. I know, it's weird. A Price is Right pricing game with questions? Yeah. In order to win the car, the contestant would have to guess three of the five questions correctly. Now, the centerpiece of this game was an animatronic professor who would nod or shake his head to indicate whether an answer was correct or incorrect. He also kept score with right answers on his upward pointing right hand and wrong answers on his downward pointing left hand. If the contestant gave three wrong answers, that contestant would lose. So the first question would be a general knowledge question with a numerical answer between zero and nine. After this question, the contestant was shown the last two digits in the price of the car. The second question was whether or not the answer to the first question was one of the first two digits in the car's price. Question three was another trivia question, and question four, if needed, asked whether the answer was the remaining digit in the price of the car. The fifth question, if needed, was another trivia question. That didn't really fit into the whole motif of the price is right, did it? Nope. It was just all very bizarre because you would have Professor Price introduced to uh, Pomp and Circumstance and he had like his own little podium. It was just very goofy. I mean, it sounds like something experimental back in the day and truth be told, it sounds almost like something Jay Wolpert would have done. For it's all just we something know, Jay Wolpert could, game. Yeah, for all we know, this could very well be a Jay Wolpert joint. And, yeah, it, it just seemed totally out of place, the, the trivia questions. Trivia has no place on Prices Right, even if it's simple questions like how many sides are there on an octagon or a stop sign. I, I get that's, you know, pretty common knowledge, but totally just very weird, very bizarre. Uh, and, yeah, it only lasted a week, literally a week. The f- debut was November 14th of 1977. And its final playing was a week later, November 21st of 1977. Wow. Played played two times, won two times. That's crazy. Plus, plus also, I don't know if you know this, guys. This is a number of years ago. I want to say it was within the last maybe 10 years, maybe even a little bit longer than that. Did you know Professor Price was on eBay? Yes! What? Professor Price was on eBay. Somebody put him on eBay, 
And I don't remember. I, I think it sold because maybe the person didn't realize what he had for sale or what she had for sale. But uh, I remember, you know, the bidding got into like the $400 range. The seller didn't know what they had. And I think somebody mentioned to the seller, oh, you've got this prop that Price is Right used for a total of two uh, playings. And it was beat up. Uh, I think the hair was either missing or partially missing. And maybe the mustache was screwed up a little bit. Uh, But, yeah, and I think even the... uh, in the picture that the the seller posted on eBay, I think that Professor Price still had like a finger up or something like that. But yeah, Professor Price was on eBay. Again, I want to say it was like over 10 years ago, but it was not in the recent past. But oh, could you imagine buying that for the museum, Greg? Oh my God. Where, where do you think it would go? Oh, it would be the conductor on the super train. Oh, it definitely would. Or, or maybe it would be like accompanying uh, the statue of McLean Stevenson. Oh, yeah. You have it right next to the statue of McLean Stevenson that greets the guests. <laughs> and, and Professor Price is giving them fingers they enter. <laughs> That's terrible. That's... You're terrible. I know I am. I know I am. I'll try to make it up with this next game, though. Split Decision. Split Decision, I remember from, not necessarily my years growing up, it it would have been about 25 years ago or so. Uh, It debuted in November of 1995, but uh, was retired January of 1997. So it only lasted about 14 months. This is a game I thought had a lot of promise. I really did. So you had an array of eight numbers, Eight digits were lined up in a row, and the idea was you had to give the price of a small three-digit item while the five digits left at the top gave you the price of a car. So, again, good in theory, but there's a reason it lasted just over a year. From what I remember, a lot of contestants were confused as to how to play the game. I mean, even the game changed rules after a while. Uh, Originally, when the game was played, there was a 20-second clock. So you got to uh, place as many combinations as you could in 20 seconds. And, you know, sometimes you'd have people get three combinations or three attempts, some people four. If they moved really fast, maybe eight or nine. But uh, starting in May of 1996, they simply gave the contestants three chances to win. Now, these rules were only used on two playings, and the clock returned in June of 1996. And the game was was retired just because it was, again, like, like it seems like every game, it was just too confusing for the players. But also, and you can find this on YouTube, there is a playing of Split Decision where the contestant, I don't want to say destroys the numbers, but he yanks the numbers down so hard, the numbers fall off the prop. Whoops. Yeah. So, and the thing is, Bob didn't even try putting them back on, uh, uh, on the prop itself. So you had just like this blank space uh, there, And Bob saying, okay, that number represents a zero, and that one represents a nine. Not Again, I think it's great in theory. It's just, in terms of execution, confusing, and when you've got props falling apart, that's not good. No. NG, no good. No good. But speaking of no good, Chico's got one more game. That yeah, definitely this, falls under the category of no good. Yeah, this is the one where you, you talk about all the problems that we had with all of the games that we've mentioned on this episode so far. This one has all of them and then some. You ready for this? I'm ready. I Here like this com- game. I'm just going to say, I like this game. Oh, so you're the one. I'm the one. The the game is Fortune Hunter, and it was played from November 21st, 1997 to May 11th, 2000. 
And I, I can see where you like it because it's it's a problem solver's game, basically. It, it's sort of like a logic game, exactly. Yeah. But this is where you can do you don't have to be a logical of a logical mind to win this. It's as much logic based as it is skill based. You're shown four items. And each item has a pretty little silver box with a pretty red bow on top. One of them has five thousand dollars on it in it. And here's how you find the five thousand. You have to eliminate boxes based on clues given by the host. For example, one would be eliminate the prize whose first digit is blank. Or eliminate the prize whose price is between blank and blank. Or eliminate the prize whose price is blank. Or eliminate the prize that is more than blank. Or eliminate the prize that is the least or most expensive. You get where I'm going with this. But the problem is you make one mistake and the game's done. Problem is you don't know you made that mistake until the reveal. Yep. So yeah, when you look at it, there's a combination of just pure luck. But also, you know, there is that logic. If you know your prices... And, I mean, some of the, the clues were pretty easy. Like Chico said, you know, eliminate the price that's more than $1,000. That's not generally too hard. But then when you get to a clue like eliminate the price whose first digit is eight, yeah, yeah. that might be a little trickier. Yeah, and the, uh, the four items are basically one-bit items. Four one-bit items. And if you find the money... You get the four items and the money. If you don't find the money, you get caca poo poo pee pee nothing. So that's 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 probably the be all end all of the problems with this game. It's more it's as luck based as it is skill based. You don't know when you don't know if you made a mistake until the end, and it is basically an all or none proposition. And the reason that Fortune Hunter was presumably retired uh, from our friends over at GoldenRoad.net is that it wasn't getting enough winners. Boy, I wonder why. Mm-hmm. Well, it says it says that it was won about a third of the time, which, I mean, that's better than, you know, just randomly guessing, because random guessing says you win it a fourth of the time. But, yeah... Th- as much as I enjoy the game, I understand why it didn't last that long. Yeah. Well, as I mentioned, there are other games we could have added to the list. We, we, as I said, we could have done the phone home game, which is the only regular attempt at uh, doing a pricing game with a contestant at home. Yeah, they did play alongs and stuff like that uh, throughout the years, but this is the only dedicated game that always had a at-home element. And another game that uh, didn't make the cut is Double Digits, which really, if you look at it, is a precursor to Temptation. Mm-hmm. Not the one with Rossi Morreale, the, the pricing game Temptation. That's, oh, an- we, that's, oh, another, that's I, another show, Mike. I was just going to say, that's a future episode, Temptation with Rossi Morreale. But enough about that. He's not bitter at all. No. Well... What can we say about this, uh, Chico? Well, what can we say? Well, in the 48 years of The Price is Right, you're going to have some really big games that turn out to be fan favorites. Some of them go on to be legendary, like, say, Plinko, or Dice Game, or Punch a Bunch. As for the ones that come and go without... Fanfare, well, what can I say? It was a thing on TV. They were just things on TV back in the day, yes. Well, nearly 50 years of The Price is Right. 
Not everything can be a winner. But you know what is a winner? All the stuff we have here on Place to Be Nation and on the pop feed recently on the latest episode of The Great Debate, number 10 of The Great Debate. In the latest episode, Andy Atherton is joined by Scott Fiscola, Sean Kidd, and Lee Ellis. And the gang discusses and debates a variety of sports topics, including when and how the four major sports leagues will come back after the coronavirus pandemic, what some of their favorite, quote-unquote, other sports are to watch on TV, what the upcoming NFL season will be like after a wild offseason, some of their favorite performances by athletes in TV and movies, and what are their favorite parts about going to live sporting events, as well as pop culture topics such as which actor has been the best on-screen Spider-Man, Brian Reynolds versus Chris Hemsworth, music artists they've tried to get into but can't, TV series they like to binge, whether it be the for the first time or a rewatch, Older movies that should be remade or updated. Which classics are untouchable? And what are some of their dream collectibles? And as always, the show closes with a fun, rapid-fire round that runs the gamut. In the 10th episode of The Year in Pop, Andy Atherton and Scott Criscoll, joined by J.R. Sinio D'Amato and George Bilmo, to discuss all of the goings-on in the news, sports, TV, music, and movies for the year 1981. The guys talk in depth about the royal wedding of Charles and Di, Donkey Kong, 1981 MLB player strike, New York Giants legend Lawrence Taylor, Hill Street Blues, you can't do that on television, the assassination attempts on Ronald Reagan and Pope John Paul II, the launch of MTV, and Raiders of the Lost Star. Also, be sure to check out the PTBN Wrestling Feed, which includes a dive into topics ring the gamut from the day's WWE feed yesteryear. The feed includes the Place to Be podcast, main event, Ginny and the Gems, Body Pressure Luck, PTB NXT, and so much more. Subscribe today, and while you're at it, subscribe to Jennifer Smith's The Jenny Position Feed as well as the home of Geek and Sassy, Talking Pop, Freak Out, Driving, Telling Stories, and more. And also check out the North South Connection brought to you by JT Rosero and Chad Campbell. It's the new home for Wrestling Warzone, No Holds Board, Extreme Theory of Dance, Chef Learns Wrestling, and more. We have officially kicked off our 2020 stretch party, proving the greatest WCW match ever. You have all year to do research, promote matches, and build your list. Conversation rules can be found at www.facebook.com slash gwcwmatches or on the Pro Wrestling Only message board. And be sure not to forget to check out placebnation.com each and every day. We have new voices and fresh takes bringing articles on topics in the worlds of wrestling, sports, and pop culture, including Trent Smackdown and Fox Report. This week in the WWE by John Crow, all his perspective Jason's DVD deep dive depends on popular opinion. Don't forget about veteran columns like Glenn Butler's weekly Wednesday walk around the web. And if you're doing online shopping over at Amazon.com, be sure to click on the Amazon banner on the right side of the Place to Be Nation homepage or use www.placetobenation.com slash Amazon. It takes you right to Amazon and helps out Peach Bean no extra cost to you. All right, guys, it is time for our final topic of the day. It's time to fire up your VCR as we transport back to early 1997 as we discover a magical time when the Internet, the World Wide Web, was brand new, a time where we didn't have podcasts, where we didn't have a chance to download everything we wanted amazingly fast speeds. Now we had to deal with dial-up modems, that annoying sound, as you'll hear in this episode, as we go back to our youth and discover the kid's guide to the internet. Enjoy, folks. You're going surfing on the internet. Episode 47, submission 1006, the kid's guide to the internet. The Kid's Guide to the Internet was a VHS tape released by Diamond Entertainment Corporation in early to mid-1997. On the mark, get set. We're riding on the internet, cyberspace, set free. Hello, virtual reality. Interact your appetite, searching for a website, a window to the world, got to get online. Take a spin, now you're in with the techno set, you're going surfing on the internet. Well, Mike, Chico, do you remember the days when the internet wasn't a complete hellscape? When it was a new, exciting place where we could get our information? Do our shopping, keep touch with loved ones. Yeah, there was that one week in 1998, I think. Yeah. Yep. 
What? And what do we do now? Twitter and memes. And podcasts. Yeah. Thanks for listening, yeah. by the way. Yeah. All, all except the, the uh, first part are great. But that's another rant for another subject. Um, now, you guys remember going back in the days, remember back in the mid-90s where we would all go like on AOL and just go and and type in our keywords or whatever? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yes. oh, yes. That was fun times. Did, did any of you ever go to AOL Grandstand? Uh, considering I was never on AOL, no. Were you on CompuServe? No, I was on MindSpring, and before that, Web TV, and after that, I've been on Roadrunner ever since. And I was on AOL very briefly, not very long. Um, I, I think I only had it for maybe about two months, but I, I, I don't even remember the internet we had what internet did we? I don't even remember the internet we had before that. I, I think we, uh, the, the first true internet service we had outside of AOL was we had internet service through. Uh, it was someplace like oh gosh, iOS. It, it was called. I think it was. I, I think it was an internet service that was based in New Jersey, and it had a dial-in number through Cleveland, and we had that. I think for about more or less like two years. Yeah, we had AOL up until the time in 97 where they stopped paying by the hour and it was very hard to log in. So we had to use like our local library's internet for a bit. And that was weird. That was good times. Oh yeah. And then we just we just basically used our like phone line to go surf on the uh on the websites and all. Until we got yeah. like opti- until we got like optimum in like 2002 when high speed sur- internet finally came here and boy that was a glorious day and I never had to hear that dial noise again for the rest of my life. It was that was a good time, especially if you were well on web TV like I was, and that's another story for another episode. Oh wait, do we have web TV as an entry? No. Yeah, let's put it on. Putting it on. Yeah. So, so we have so the internet. This being a new, exciting, and amazing thing, had everybody wondering what the heck it was. I mean, was it like Ted Stevens who said that it was just a series of tubes, or is it something far more complex? Well, well, it's not a big truck, Chico. Not a big truck? Okay, that's good to know. Yeah, so we had people in the mid to late 90s being like, what is this internet? I don't understand it. Thankfully, in the mid to late 90s, a company called Diamond Entertainment Corporation decided, you know what, we're going to help the people figure out what the internet is. We're going to make a series of VHS tapes trying to help the consumer understand how the internet works. So they put out some tapes featuring a family called the Jameson family trying to help the not technical person out on how the computers and the internet work. There was a series of three tapes, the family guide to computers, the family guide to the internet, and this subject, the kid's guide to the internet. You go surfing on the internet. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, Chico. This tape opens up with maybe one of the, what, a, a, a such a mid to late 90s jingle. Take a spin, now you're in with the techno set. You're going surfing on the internet. I'm curious what the difference between the family guide to the internet is and the kids guide. Well, the kids guide to the internet is just what the kids are, are into. What the kids but are that's into the point. In that's the point. What are the parents into, though? Well, it's 1997. I don't know if there's there's much for the parents to get into at the time. I mean, I don't think AdamandEve.com existed back in 1997. Oh, for the love of God, Greg. Couple words for you. 
56 K porn. <laughs> I, I see a chin. Oh, that better be a chin. <laughs> Oh my god, that's the sexiest cell <laughs> phone I think I've ever seen. Oh. I... oh, look at that porn in its lovely 120 by 90 resolution. And it's all on Real Player G2. <laughs> that was yes. the first thing I ever downloaded was Real Player, and that was on a web TV, which, by the way, is another episode. But back to the Kids Guide to the Internet. The the pixelated 120 by 90 resolution video, yes. Okay, so we're introduced to the Jameson family, the mother, the the uh, father, and their kids, Peter and Dasha. And they're talking about how the internet is really cool and amazing. Now the internet is an exciting world of new possibilities. And so Peter says, I guess this is a story about how the internet changed our lives, and maybe it will for you someday. Memes. Just saying. Memes. Yes. TikTok. TikTok. Pod- podcasting. Yes. And uh, calling women uh, insults on Twitter. Just great uh, times. Uh, it's 1997. They didn't know. Don't tell them they don't know. So the father's talking about how amazing their kids are ever since they got the internet. Like, yeah, the internet. It's helped our kids do such amazing things. It's helped them do their homework and stuff. I'm like, yeah, that's fantastic. And and, and it's quite noble, too, after all. Um junior and senior year would be radically different if I didn't have the internet. What can I say? Okay, so now we get into the part that we've been waiting for. The part where their friends arrive. And how do we know that their friends arrive? Well, is it because that the ki- that the parents were saying that they're going to go out for a bit? No. It's when the title screen says the friends arrive. Yeah, in case you were too stupid, this is the part where the friends arrive. You're going surfing on the internet. And we have uh, our two friends, Lisa and Andrew. They're, they're uh, neighborhood kids, and they don't have the internet just yet. Oh. But in real life, they're actually brother and sister. Yep. Yes. And of course, the Jameson family, they're not related at all. But big fat phonies. They're a big phony. All right, now we go into an introduction on the internet. And how do you know it's an internet introduction? The title card says, an internet introduction. Again, they think you're too stupid not to figure this out. And also, you get to hear the music again. Yes. You're going surfing on the internet. And also, as Dasha tells you, the first thing you need to know is that the internet is amazing. No. Well, in 1997, it would have been amazing. Well, it was amazing when it was new and it was new and shiny in 1997. Now it's, uh, anyway. Now it's a given. It's a given. Let's say that. Yeah. So, so they have the kids talking about how you can play games with the internet and how you can chat online. Remember when web chats were a thing? That was awesome. Yeah. There's world, the World Wide Web, and then there's news groups. Oh, boy, guys, news groups. We all met through, the, through a news group. Yes. It's it ETS forever, baby. Yeah. Oh, man, if you didn't live through all of the uh, annoyingness of Steve Nard, thank God. So, the one, one thing you need to take away from all of this is web pages begin with HTTP colon forward slash forward slash www. That's the one thing you need to take away from all of this. Another thing you need to take away all, from all of this is these guys use Netscape a lot. Which yes. means that even back in 1997, Internet Explorer 
was the browser you used to find a better browser. <laughs> Am I wrong? No, you're not wrong. That's why I'm laughing. Well, also, in this segment, they search MTV.com. Now, guys, remember that for later on in this tape. Okay. Duly noted. MTV.com. So got it. Yeah. Yeah. So they talk about how the internet can be used to help find some helpful information. Like, for instance, Peter used the World Wide Web to search the archives of the Smithsonian Institute a few weeks ago at www.si.com. Wait a minute, that's Sports Illustrated, dude. Because here's the thing. Remember, the guys, this is 1997. What would Sports Illustrated have been involved with at the time? CNN Sports Illustrated. Oh, God. Yes, CNNSI.com. And there's also a point where Peter is writing the president. Who at this time would be Bill Clinton. He was was writing the president with a a very basic letter. something Something like right out of the electric company. Dear Mr. President, my name is Peter. My sister name is Dasha. My friends, Neighbor Andrew and Lisa, we were just wondering, we were just telling everybody how great the internet was and how we need more in our schools. Sincerely, Andrew, Lisa, Peter, and Dasha. And, and apparently, commas weren't a thing back then because they show the email. And actually, I have it in front of me. Chico pretty much covered it. Dear Mr. President, my name is Peter. My sister is Dasha. Our friends Lisa and Andrew came over today because we are teaching them how cool the internet is. Please get more computers for our schools. It makes learning more fun. Thank you sincerely. And there's no commas here except for the Oxford comma, interestingly enough. Andrew, Lisa, Peter, comma, and Dasha. And they insist that, yes, if we send this email to the president, the president's going to read it. Spoiler. They don't know. They don't know. Not. Don't tell them. They don't know. It's 23 years later. I think they found out he didn't respond. Because, of course, if it was Bill Clinton, how would he respond? How old are you, Dasha? You 18 yet? I uh, see you got your friend uh, Lisa there. Is she 18? Oh, no, no. No, no, no. They would have, you know, he would have responded with, thanks for your, thanks for your letter. Expect five more in the next 30 minutes asking for money for my re-election fund. Oh, wait, no, it wouldn't be his re-election fund because he's on his second term. My mistake. You're going surfing on the internet. All right, here's the next part. The basics. The things you need to get online. First thing you need. Wait, I got this. A computer? A key telephone cable and an internet provider. Uh, how how many did I get right, Mr. Trebek? All three. All three. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. Of course, well, of course, in 1996, you'd have 1996, 1997, you'd have one of the many plethora of diskettes that AOL would send you in the mail. And you'd also need uh, a screen name, a password, and apparently your credit card. Because, you know, they got to take the money from somewhere, right? See, I don't remember inputting my credit card information into AOL back in the day. Uh, I actually had to call them up. Just something I noticed. Oh, okay. By the way, if you notice on the screen where Peter and Dasha's dad presumably put put their uh, credit card information, the bank name is supposed to be Citibank Visa, but for some reason he spelled it Citbank Visa. Well, also the card number, I'm sorry, this isn't really... Well, hold on a second. Wait. Now, this gets a little deeper. I was going to indicate the card number, 0123... Four five six seven eight nine zero one two three four five, but now I'm looking at it. Yeah, it says ba- bank name Sit Bank Visa, but also it says bank name First Virginia Bank. What type what? of scam is Rich Jameson trying to run? 
he probably got 15 to 20 years in the clink for doing some some he probably might have been the initial founder of the dark web for all we know you stole oh, it just from me that's exactly what i was gonna say oh, rich, rich jameson Jam- created the dark web prove you me wrong dirty dirty dog we got your we got our computer problems fixed we backed up our data we defragged our disk by the way defrag simply means allocating allocating memory so that it is no longer fragmented but y'all are smart you knew that and following installation manual if you can find the damn manual <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, and now uh, you're going surfing on the internet. Getting online. <laughs> okay, uh, all of your tubes are all of your tubes are hooked up. All of your things are working. Now it's time to go online. Uh, now you got to type in your username, your password. You got to wait for that damn noise to come in when you dial up that. Or if you're like me and had web TV back in the day, you would just listen to that hip uh, logging on music. But it's not as hip as that Skype ringtone. The thing you need to surf the internet now is a browser. What's a browser? A browser is a program that allows you to surf internet content. For example, we have Netscape, which our kids are using, and, well, right now we also have Firefox and Chrome, but back then you only had Internet Explorer, which, like I said before, is the browser you use to find a better browser. You had Pepsi and Coke and nothing else. Yeah. No RC for you, kids. Yeah, you didn't even have Opera back then. Which is sad. But anyway, you've downloaded Internet Explorer. You used what, that Chico? to download. Yeah. What does download mean? <laughs> I'm glad you asked that question. It's a, a transfer, a file, or of information from a main computer or server to your computer. So once you've loaded your browser or already have it on your computer, you'll open it and it will give you a selection of search and Oh, wait. I'm oh, sorry. Here we go. Oh, <laughs> I was I was doing my Peter impersonation there, and I just got totally method. Anyway, so now that you have your browser, we're going to a search engine, which back in 1997, you didn't have much of the way of, of browsers, but there was like you could th- you couldn't throw your 56k modem without hitting a search engine. Yeah. And what's the first search engine they used? Alta Vista. Good times. Yeah. I I was more of an Ask Jeeves guy, to be honest. Like us, man. Been, no, I've like been a Yahoo person since the beginning, or at least back then. Yeah, and you also used Yahoo as your search engine. Oh, well, it's a good thing you mentioned Yahoo, because Lisa has heard of Yahoo. Oh, that's good. <laughs> so, but search here. engines, they identify different categories. When you decide what you're interested in, you click from the topic from the menu or type in a specific web address or word to identify a particular topic. And then the search engine links you to that information. Yeah, I remember the days where Yahoo would just list websites. And you just have to click on something, and you'd have to find it instead of just typing it in. Those were good times. Yeah, it was hey. nice and organized. Because you need to remember, it was Jerry and David's guide to the World Wide Web to start off with. Mm-hmm. They were thinking of us. But yeah, since this is the kids' guide to the internet, they were using Yahooligans, which would be the kid-filtered version of Yahoo. It was the 1997 equivalent of YouTube Kids. Uh-huh. Before we move on, the sites they visited, they were doing research on uh, apparently astronomy and the stars in space. 
and they visited NASA.gov, but the second page they visited, sadly, this person hasn't been with us for 10 years. They went to StarHustler.com. They went to the website of Jack Horkheimer. You know who I'm talking about. I that know guy, exactly that, who you're talking exactly. about. I miss and that guy. And you know guy. what? He's going to be an entry, too, right now. Jack Horkheimer, Star Hustler from WPBT in Miami. Is this another Mr. Food type personality? Yes. Yes, oh. it is. You know yeah, who we Jack never Horkheimer got... is? We never got those people on the news in New York City. Well, no, what's on the news is on, he's on PBS. It was on, oh, at least okay. here, he's on like, like every Friday night at like 9.55 or 10.55 okay. at night. Okay, well, maybe Channel 13 or 21 here probably aired it, but I was... Yeah, I was, we, I need, was yeah. That. yeah we need to talk about Jack Horkheimer while they're looking at ways to write their name in hieroglyphics because, yeah, <laughs> content. You're going surfing on the internet. Here's a quick review. You need an internet service provider to give you uh, the uh, internet. You need to download or install a browser. And also, you should probably use a search engine to look for information. And also, you should probably deliver all of this information while staring into space, presumably. Because instead of talking to her friends, Lisa is looking at the fourth wall. Yeah, in fact, everybody's, talking look, to? everybody's looking at the fourth wall. They, they, lo- they like, like to switch between talking to each other. And looking at the fourth wall. Yeah, who are these kids talking to? Who are you guys talking to? Come back to us. We're over here. Yeah, they're not. They they can't hear us. Uh, anyway, uh, let's uh, let's uh, surf some more, shall we? Yeah, they go to the Kennedy Space Center website, and they talk about how a lot of ant dresses are pretty easy, and many of the very well known prices use something called. Dot com, which stands for commercial, and dot gov, which stands for government, and dot org, which stands for organization. Isn't that very simple, guys? Yeah. It gets even more simple later on down the line. Of course, this was uh, around the time they also used dot edu, but this was way before dot church, dot library, dot something. Not anything, not this, not that, not the other thing. You're going surfing on the internet. Surfing the net. Oh, this is the best part, guys. Oh, boy. So Andrew saw something about you looking up current events online. So he wonders, can we look up newspapers, too? Well, gee, Andrew, you can. This was before the age of the paywall, by the way. Yeah, when newspapers thought, yeah, let's put all of our stuff in the paper on our website for free. Surely this won't come to bite us back on the ass. And still. So, yeah, we're, we see the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, C- uh, the Los Angeles Times, and CNN. And not only do we see CNN.com, but we see a special subsection on the CNN.com website devoted to the re-release of the Star Wars trilogy. Did you actually take a look at the New York Times website that they had in the video? There's uh, a st- oh oh, there's a story in the Cyber Times section which says pushed by states, America online plans refunds. That must have been with the uh the, the what I taught you about about how the uh how they kept overlogging after they uh got rid of the the uh paying by the hour. Uh-huh. Yeah, and the date that it has on here is January 30th of 1997, so that sort of makes sense if they stopped it say December 31st of 96. Yeah, it's all coming into place beautifully now. Yes it is. Next we're learning about bookmarks. Bookmarks? What are bookmarks? That's a good question. Bookmarks are sort of web pages that you don't have to type the whole name out. You just save it as a bookmark, 
and you can access it from your browser almost instantaneously. Amazing. Are you talking about favorites? Yes. No, no, the answer is no. I'm talking about bookmarks. Okay. No, I'm talking about bookmarks. Oh, okay. There's a difference. Get it right. Okay, thank you for, for educating me. So after they're done searching about how to dissect a frog online, they go through a bunch of of movie websites. They go to the website of 77film.com, the home of movie phone. Guys, you remember movie phone? I remember movie phone. Welcome to movie phone. Um, I'm I'm going to try going to 77film.com right now. And it's an empty browser or it's an empty site. 777film. Not 77film. There's three sevens. Yes, because it was a phone number. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to 777film.com. And uh, uh, nothing's happening. Well, if you go to moviephone.com, there's still something there. Well, at least it exists in some form. Anyways, the website advertises something called the American Movie Goer Awards. And... I have no idea what that is, considering I searched for it on Google, and nothing shows up for that. Oh, well. So now the kids go surfing around a website called Film.com. And if you notice closely, if you pause on the 1938 mark in the video, I'll read something on the right sidebar for a movie called Albino Alligator. One of last year's Oscar winners, Kevin Spacey, steps behind the camera to create a flawed but ambitious actor's movie. Wow, guys, talk about something that doesn't age well in 2020. Yeah, that aged like um, cottage cheese. Yep. Now we go into searching the big website that the kids were all going to in early 1997. Oh, you mean at night? Oh, yeah. Yeah, baby. Every every kid was going to nickatnight.com in 1996. In 1997. Everyone wow. wanted to see what was going on TV land. I remember wanting to see what was going on TV land, but then again, I was a weird kid. Yeah. So you have all the lists of all the shows they got. You got some retro commercials. You got your dramas like your Mannixes, your Cannons, your Gunsmokes. Your Hill Street Blues. Oh, and guys, Seen Elsewhere. Can't forget about Seen Elsewhere on TV Land. Oh, yeah. By the way, that's a callback to a previous episode of this podcast. Yeah. Uh, you know what would have been so amazing? What would have been really nice is if they had a seven year flashback back to the 1990 Nick at Night contest regarding Alfred Hitchcock Presents with Wink Martindale. Oh, by the way, future installment. The 1990 Halloween Wink Martindale Alfred Hitchcock presents contest on Nick at Night. No, Mike, that's not where I was going. But yeah, thanks about the Alfred Hitchcock presents contest. That's gonna be fun. No, considering Saint Elsewhere is on the page, you know what I wish would have happened in this VHS tape. What's that? If time traveling Ed Begley Jr. showed up and his tortoise made an adventure on set to the kids. Excuse me, I'm here in. The 1970s, right? I have some people in the Bay Area to kill. And the kids would be like, Mr. Bigley, this is 1997. And then Mr. Bigley would be like, oh, yeah, you're right. Thanks, kids. <laughs> Boy, that was a callback to how many episodes there? Two, maybe three? <laughs> maybe. Another future installment. They played a clip of the episode of Mr. Ed where he went surfing. And it was a glorious quick time video with about 120 by 90 resolution. Oh, yeah. My God, we're going to probably do a whole series about Mr. Ed doing human things. Like Mr. Ed riding a car, Mr. Ed skateboarding. Oh, and by the way, speaking of Mr. Ed, guys, future installment. Are you kidding me? 
The oh, two come on. The 2004 Mr. Ed reboot by it, with Sherman Helmsley as the voice of Mr. Ed. You're just making this hard for us now, aren't you? Oh, yeah. And you know who else was in that pilot, baby? It looks Cheryl- like Davey Presley, but I don't know. Cheryl and Finn from Twin Peaks. So you know what that means? Yes, it gives me enough for an excuse to talk about Twin Peaks on this podcast. You're never going to run out of excuses to talk out of talk about Twin Peaks, are you? No. Okay, hold on a second. I think I'm going to make another executive decision here. Oh, no. Oh, no. Okay, I'm... Oh, Frank TV, I'm sorry. You're out of here. Thank <laughs> you! <laughs> yeah, so we're going to talk about... What are we going to talk about? This? Yes. Oh, shit. Hold yeah, on. Screw you. screw you, Frank Caliendo. We're talking Mr. <laughs> You're welcome, people. Yeah, we speared you, Frank TV, everybody. Woo! So now that we've done going through Nick at Night, Andrew wants to go to the MTV website, and he wonders, would that be MTV.com? Yeah, Andrew, what the hell else would it be? It was typed earlier in the damn, damn tape. Were you not paying attention, Andrew? He was too busy look not he was too busy wondering if he should look at his sister or us. But man, looking at the MTV website from early nineteen ninety seven, you have frames. Do you remember frames on websites? I remember frames on oh, websites. Oh yes. Torturous. But also you have an online banner advertisement for the John Leguizamo movie, The Pest. <laughs> for our Patriot, for our Patreon spinoff podcast, it was a thing at the movies. Coming sometime in 2022. Get your, five, get your five donations ready. <laughs> <laughs> your five dollar donations. <laughs> So after they were shopping at Ticketmaster.com, that is Ticketmaster.com, for uh, for tickets to the ballet, they're going to search for free screensavers because they don't know about malware yet. Yeah, malware would have just been starting to be a thing probably at this point. Malware and bloatware, all they do is type in screensaver free. And they find a free screensaver. Nothing on the internet is free, folks. Yeah. The only thing that would have made this even more funny is they've searched for Bonsai Buddy. The one takeaway of this is when they're downloading the screensaver, did you see what speed it was downloading at? Yes. A blazing, yeah, a blazing 894 bytes a second. They must be some rich people. They have fourth the fast internet. 892 bytes a second. Amazing. Indeed. Okay, uh, so now they're looking up sports on the internet. And one of the uh, sites visited is sportsnetwork.com, which if you visit it today, guess where it takes you? Stats. Yeah. So they got swallowed up by the Stats Inc. family. Mm hmm. They also visited tvdi.com slash sports, which back then would have been a collaboration with Fox Sports, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yes, because at the time, Rupert Murdoch owned TV Guide. Mm hmm. Okay, so they go to the NFL on Fox schedule. And so, considering that we've already established it's January 30th, 1997, uh, the Super Bowl probably would have been played a few days earlier. So you're not going to get anything out of that. Yeah, no. January 26th of 1997. So, well, you, you could have seen who won between the Green Bay Packers and the New England Patriots. And gosh darn it, I hope those Patriots lose. Yeah. Screw Troy Blood. Screw 
Scroop. Screw blue. Screw. <laughs> screw Drew Bledsoe. Exactly. I guarantee you that every Patriots fan in 2020 who's listening to this podcast has no idea who Drew Bledsoe is. And screw that young kicker for the Patriots, Adam Vinatieri. Yeah. Until he until he redeems himself in 2006 with Indianapolis. But enough dating ourselves. Let's talk about email. You're going surfing on the internet. What is this email people are talking about? E- email? Oh, oh well, it stands for electronic mail. It, oh, I get it. It's mail sent electronically. You just type in the name of the person you want to send your message to and write your message out and then click send. You use a mail program for that. So where can you go for email, uh, Chico, for free email? Well, this would be late. This would be January 30th, 1997. So you could go to judo.com or mailzone.com. Of course, the the interesting thing, they mention Internet Explorer for like five seconds. They do not mention Hotmail. Hmm. I don't think it was owned by MSN at the time. Right, I was going to say, I don't think it was a Microsoft property back then. No. But yeah, MailZone.com. Mike, I know you have so many things to say about this. Uh, Yeah, specifically, uh, be careful how you type it or else you're going to go to the website the father visited when mom goes to sleep. Oh, God. (laughs) And and, and Juno.com, I can confirm that only one user still uses Juno.com as their email service. And his name rhymes with Fave Smeltzer. <laughs> oh, jeez. Oh, so if you go to MailZone.com, that is MailZone.com, not MailZone.com, it redirects you to the 404 page for Pobox.com. And if you go to the other MailZone.com... Oh, no. Oh, thank God, it's a for sale website. <laughs> but related links include adult personal, casual sex adult cam sex, free chatting online dating sites, and free chat with men. That's for our Patreon subscribers. Oh, gosh. And remember, kid, and remember, all web addresses are subject to change. I know this because there's a title card that says that. Now, what can you do to build your own website? Well, if it's 1997, you could go to GeoCities. Yes. But how can you build a build a great website cheap, guys? You, you go, to go to C- GeoCities. No, but you could, no, if no. you want to build a great website cheap, you could go to CNET.com slash content slash features slash how to slash instant. And that'll teach you how to build your own website. In ten easy steps, no less. Ten easy steps. What you know, it'd probably been a lot easier if I just saw the steps on how to do it on the CNET TV show. <laughs> you know what's the amazing thing is, out of this entire tape, CNET.com is probably like one of the few sites that still exists. Yep. You wouldn't be wrong. Yep. So now the Jameson's mother has arrived, and they're and the Andrew and Elisa are like, "Oh my God, Mrs. Jameson, I can't believe we lived life without the internet. Oh my God, the internet is so amazing, Mrs. Jameson." Well, that's what it, that's. Hey, Dasha said the first thing that Dasha says is the internet is amazing. That's the first thing. Were you not paying attention? I was paying about as much attention as Andrew did when he saw MTV.com at the beginning. <laughs> You're going surfing on the internet. Internet safety. So now we close with the Jameson's mother talking about to the parents about how they can monitor their children, your children on the internet. Spoiler, you can't. Yep. 
<laughs> but the Jameson's mother talks about how he's never, she's never been happier than when her children have an internet computer party. Guys, have you ever heard the term internet computer party in your entire lives? Does LAN party count? No? I guess, okay. I guess maybe for playing your intense sessions of GoldenEye on N64. Maybe. Or Doom. So one important thing about safety, guys, is you got to remember, the internet is not regulated. So the quality of, like, information and educational stuff can vary quite a bit. Remember this in a couple of years, guys, when Wikipedia launches. Yep. And that, in a nutshell, is the internet circa 1997. An interesting thing about... The, uh, it's like, forget about the information for a moment. I'm looking at the IMDB pages of the cast people. Anne, the mom, is actually a producer known for a bunch of movies that I've never heard of, and also an actress in a bunch of movies I've never heard of. But she did do a thing in 1989 called Ninja Academy, so that's... Yeah, that doesn't scream. That doesn't scream direct to direct to uh, direct to video. Did it start in via rock rock? Uh, I don't. I don't know. Let yeah, me look. It no. starred <laughs> Will Egan, Will Egan, Gerald Okamura, Kelly Randall, Michael David, Jeff Robinson. I only I've only heard of Gerald Okamura because he was on an episode of Power Rangers. Okay, so no Cynthia Rothrock, no go for me. No Cynthia, she would have been like the first one in the credits. Uh, Rich, Rich, the father, is a host on TVG Network. What? Yeah, the horse, the horse racing channel. Boss, and all comes Man. back to horses on this episode. Hey, he must have been really excited when Peter showed him the clip of uh, Mr. Ed surfing. <laughs> Peter, this was pretty much his only credit. Oh. Which, is odd be- this, which is odd because he was the best actor of the four. Yeah, that's not saying much, but he was incredible. Uh, Dasha... She was in A Perfect Pitch, which I never heard of. And the two neighborhood kids, Andrew and Lisa. Andrew, this was his only credit. And Lisa, who, by the way, is indeed his sister, is the only one with a very extensive IMDb page to her name. She was, she played Mrs. Walters on an episode of 911. And she was in a bunch of other movies. But, yeah, this was her first credit. Nowadays, she's known for, again, her appearances on 911 and something called Porcupine. I have no idea what... Oh, Porcupine is a short movie. That makes a so lot there of you, sense. Yeah. So, that's the kid's guide to the internet. But, yeah, guys... Kid's Guide to the Internet. This was something to behold. You had weird jingles telling us about how we're going surfing on the internet. You had nickatnight.com, the hot website all the kids were going to. 120 by 90 clips of on QuickTime of Mr. Ed surfing. And you have the whole family excited to go to Ticketmaster and buy tickets to go see the Rolling Stones. Even the kids were excited. Hey, I hey, I was excited for the Rolling Stones in 1997. But then again, I'm a, I was a weird kid. So yeah, the Kids Guide to the Internet, it was an educational VHS tape and you can its legacy lives on on YouTube, and on, currently on RiffTracks.com where you can buy a riff of the VHS tape for a dollar ninety nine. And if you ask me, it's a buck ninety nine well spent. Worth every penny. Yeah. 
We definitely don't Kids. do it justice. Uh huh. Kids Guide to the Internet. It was a thing on TV. Yeah, it was definitely a thing on VHS. And get people, we will have more amazing VHS tapes to give you down the line. For example, we are already have as an entry Regis Philbin's workout tape, Regis, my personal workout, and future installment, Fighting Fit with Rowdy Roddy Piper. Oh, speaking of Rowdy oh, Roddy baby. Piper, we're going to talk about him next week. Ooh. Yeah. Can't wait for that. Oh, that'll be fun. That'll be good times. But yeah, it's time to close. It's time to log off. Have a bunch don't of forget, don't forget don't forget to clear your search history. Oh yeah, clear the search history. We don't Jeez. want we don't want our it's parents. It's nineteen ninety seven. They don't know about that yet. Yeah, they don't know about that yet, thank God. They won't they're not well, you know what? They're not smart enough to find out what we searched. Although let's be thankful. It's nineteen ninety seven. Pornhub doesn't exist, so we don't have to worry oh, about that. Oh god. www.itwasathingontv.com. That's all I'm gonna say. Goodbye. Have a good day. You're going surfing on the internet.